Welcome back, everybody. So let's, uh, let's put our laptops away. Everybody could close them up. That'd be good. Close them up. Um, so I don't know if any of you have been following, but uh, it looks like minor number 29 out of 33 is on their way up. So you know, about the, you know about the miners that have been stuck in Chile underground for two months, right? So uh, it's actually pretty cool if you guys get to see any video. They built this shaft, and they're kind of transporting them up one at a time. And it's about once every 40 minutes or something. They're, so they're hoping to get the rest of them up today. So there's only uh, four and a half of them left. So, All right. OK, settle down. So let's uh, very quickly review this slide where technology actually failed us last time. I wanted to make sure that we didn't totally confuse you. you is that pretty good? All right. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, this was a very simple translation example. I just wanted to make sure everybody was with me on the same page. We'll do this very quickly. But if we're trying to run this code, OK, and by the way, those of you who have your design docs ready for Friday uh, have started thinking a lot about translation. And uh, you're actually going to be running MIPS code, which is this. So this is a pretty apropos slide. If you look here, we have addresses on the left. These are virtual addresses. How do I know that? Why do I know that these are virtual addresses? Yes. Yeah, because they're, the, what, they're what the CPU is dealing with. OK, unless. Otherwise noted, the CPU deals with the virtual addresses. And that means uh, thing, addresses that go into registers, addresses that represent instructions, addresses that are for loads and stores. All of the addresses are virtual. And it's only when you go out to DRAM that you actually translate. OK, so what's a good example of going to DRAM? Well, fetching an instruction. Why is that? Because the instruction's in DRAM, right? So here. If we start with a PC at uh, 2040 hex or 240 hex, notice that uh, in order to fetch that, we've got to translate. So what did we do? We said virtual segment 0 offset 240. And remember, we're dealing with 16-bit uh, addresses here, where the top two bits are the virtual segment. So the top two bits of this, of a 16-bit number, is 0. And you know that because the, the uh, top nibble is all zeros, and therefore, certainly the top two bits are. So we look at segment 0. We notice that in real space, or in the actual DRAM, that's base 4,000 hex. There's a limit of 800 on this segment. So what that means is to fetch 240 virtual, we take the base 4,000. We add the offset, which is right here, 240. And that gives us 4240. And that's where we go in the DRAM to pull the instruction out. OK? Were there any questions on that? That makes sense to everybody? OK. So we're only really going to DRAM when we actually translate. Uh, you know, and once we get our instruction, notice what is this instruction? This is load address of var x into a0. Well, what's the address of var x? Well, var x in virtual space has an address of 4050. That's why we're moving 4050 into a0. OK, because virtual addresses in the CPU, I mean, all addresses in the CPU are virtual. Does that make sense, everybody? OK, when we go next to fetch the next instruction, oh, by the way, when I did PC plus is to PC equal PC plus 4, I'm adding 4 to the virtual PC to 240 hex to get 244 hex. I translate that. Basically, essentially the same as before. So I'm going to go to the DRAM at physical address 4244. That's going to pull up this jump and link instruction to string length. Where is string length? Well, that is at virtual address 360. OK, so that's why when we're jumping, we're going to put 360 into the PC, because the PC only has virtual addresses. And why do we put 248 into the return address? First of all, is 248 there a virtual or physical address? Virtual, good, because it's going in the 
processor, why are we putting 248 into the return address? Because that's when we return, we're going to return to 248, which is the instruction right after 244. OK? Now, of course, <laughs> if you took a 152, you'd have to worry about this being pipelined, and then there'd be a delay slot, and you'd be really returning to a different instruction than 248. It'd be, uh, <laughs> but anyway, 24C. But that's a whole story you don't have to worry about. So uh, now we're going to execute here. We're, uh, How'd you like that little bit of magic? When they have a pipeline, there's a delay slot out of, after jump and link. But fortunately, you guys don't have to worry about that. So, so from when we fetch 360, we do a similar translation. Notice how all the instructions are coming out of segment 0. That shouldn't surprise you, because we probably picked a segment to put the instructions in. OK? Not surprising. Um, now, notice what this guy does is it, puts, it takes the constant 0. This is load. Uh, immediate puts the constant 0 into v0. So we're moving the constant into z0, uh, v0. We add 4 to the PC. We get down to here. This is our first kind of really, truly interesting instruction. Because first, we have to translate to, to, do the, uh, to fetch the instruction. So we have to translate 364 virtual into 4364 physical. That will let us get this instruction, which is load byte. Uh, contents of A0 into T0. But now to do the load, we've got to do another translation, because this is a virtual address that's in A0, 4050. To load from it, we have to translate. So what segment is 4050 in? Okay. Well, we all, virtually we only have four possible segments, 0, 1, 2, and 3. So which one is it? One. How do I know that? How do I know that this is in segment one, address 4050? Yeah. Uh, OK, leftmost four bits are 0, 1, 0, 0. Everybody see that? Because that's the number four, I mean the hex digit four. So if the, the leftmost bits are 0, 1, 0, 0, what are the leftmost two bits? 0, 1, segment one. OK, now. I realize this seems silly to have gone through twice, but you'd be surprised. You're on an exam. You got your address laid out. Which segment is it in? Uh, you got to mark off the two bits, and there, there it is, right? I mean, just keep calm if you see uh, us actually ask you to translate on the exam, which we might do, right? So when we translate it, we say it's virtual segment one. The offset is 50. Why? Because the only thing left after we get rid of the 0, 1 from 40, 50 hex is 50. Right? And so now we look up segment 1. We see the base is 4,800. Therefore, when we add 50 hex to it, we get 4,850. And that's why our physical address is there. And then last but not least, at the very end of the day, we load from physical address 4,850 into register T0. And we declare this slide dead. So how are we doing? Does this make sense to everybody? Feel free to ask questions now or forever rest in pieces or something. I don't know. Yes? OK, so that's a great question. So the question is, my segments are different sizes right? Yes and no. Okay, the actual part that I can address in the segments are clearly different sizes. However, if you were to look at the segments in virtual space, you'd see that they're spaced out regularly, right? So there's space enough in segment 0 if I wanted to raise this limit all the way up to 4,000 to support 4,000 hex things. But actually, what I can get at at the time is 800 of those. So this address space has all the space there, but the actual physical memory I've allocated is varying in sizes. So you got to be careful. Kind of the physical space here is varying sizes. The virtual space, you could kind of make an argument either way as to whether they're the same size or not. OK, good question. Anybody else? OK, the best way to deal with virtual memory things is to try to imagine that you're a processor only talking
virtual addresses. And in order to get the physical addresses, they got to go through some translation. Think of memory somewhere over there. All right, and you got to translate the addresses you're asking for to where they are actually in DRAM. OK, I'm going to let this, yeah, question. Would this be worse to raise the uh, size of the code segment Yeah, the way I've got this laid out right now, I can't actually make the code segment bigger because it would run into the data segment. Yes, so I've got, I've got a fragmentation problem with this kind of segmentation. I've got to move things around in physical memory to make more space in this case. Yes, good. OK. I don't want to belabor this anymore, but because the <laughs> somebody screwed up, namely Windows 2010 screwed up my uh, animation. This was pretty bad last time. Okay, so after we did that, we kind of talked about a tree of tables, and this was a case where, if you remember now, we've sort of moved into actually having pages rather than segments as our lowest level, and so in this case of a tree of tables, this was kind of one of the more interesting uh, address mappings. And notice the first thing I'd ever do in trying to understand an address is I'd draw out a box like this. And uh, probably even on paper, I'd say, well, this offset is so many bits. And so I'd put a number there. And this virtual page is so many bits. And I'd put numbers there to figure out what bit number I'm talking about. Because then you could actually lay your address down there and, and figure out what bits you're talking about. But in principle, to do page mappings, Notice that we just copy the offset to the physical address. And now it's all about taking the, the rest of the bits, which we'll call the virtual page number, and turning it into a physical page number. In this case, I've taken that virtual piece and I've divided it up into multiple pieces. And in this case, I've sort of one piece as a segment. So I take the first few bits. How many bits are here, by the way? Quick. How many bits of the address? Three. Everybody got three? Why do I say three? Log base two of eight, right? There are eight possibilities here. There are only three bits. OK? OK, so three bits. Suppose this is 4K pages. How many virtual pages are left? Well, 4K is how many bits? 12. Three bits is how many bits? 3, so 12 plus 3 is 15. 32 minus 15, 17. OK, so that is 100,000 about, right? 130,000. OK, so uh, 17 bits here. OK, so we could have a lot of pages. In this case, we have a limited number of pages. But we take this number, whatever it is, use it as an index. Notice that our virtual segment ID gave us a base, but in this double level case, the base is actually a page table base. We take our virtual page number in here. That selects the page number, um, or selects the page table entry. And we pull the page number out, put it in here, copy it. We've got our physical address. Yes? So there are actually a lot more entries in the second. Well, there's potentially a lot more entries. So be, be careful about if there are a lot more entries versus potentially a lot more entries. Because in fact, what we do is, this limit now is actually a limit of number of pages. It's a num and we will check. And if the, if the page table, the virtual page number in this case is bigger than the limit, then we'll get an error. And so this page table in this particular scheme is limited to be no longer than what we said our limit was. That's a good question. Okay. So not every address is valid in this scheme. For instance, any address for which the top three bits are 101 is not valid. Why? Well, because when you go to look it up in this segment table, you see an N, not valid. Therefore, 101 is an invalid address. Furthermore, if we take base, so if we have a 2 here, so 010, that's valid once we get past the segment ID. But it's possible that if we have a virtual page number up here that's too big, we're going to be beyond the end. And that will be an invalid address. So a lot of these schemes have sparseness as part of them, where there are holes in the address space. And that's actually kind of a good thing, okay? because we want to be able to grow the heap and the stack separately and so on. Okay. All right. And so the last thing we can do here is also check the permissions on the final page. And it's possible that, you know, here we're good to go because we're trying to read and write. But suppose that this was read only like one of these, then uh, we try to write it, we get a fault. Or if it says not valid, we'll get a fault. Yeah, question. Is 
Well, the limits are going to represent the number of pages actually in the table. Because you know how many could be by just taking two to the number of bits here. Right? So, so the number that could be is not as interesting as the number that are actually there. Well, if you were to make, put more pages into this segment, you could grow this limit. Yes. OK, yes. So the Well, that's a great question. Does the physical have 32 and the virtual have 32? Necessarily. Not necessarily. OK, often. Not necessarily. And in fact, what's often the case today is the, phys the virtual is 64 bits, and the physical is 40 bits or 48 bits or something. So uh, that's a great question to make sure you have answered uh, if you're not clear. I mean, if we don't really tell you, uh, uh, if you're not clear, you should ask us. But you know, the default may be a 32 with a 32. But you know, today, when the bit sizes here get so big, I mean, it just makes no sense to have physical sizes that are that big. Well, if it's embedded, then it's going to be even smaller on the physical side. Yeah. Good questions. OK. Uh, so what do we need to save and restore in a context switch? That's always a useful thing to know. Here, in this case, it's kind of the, the uh, segments are what we're saving and restoring. Because these page tables can happily sit in memory and be left alone. We could have many processes page tables all just kind of laid out in memory somewhere. And it's this set of green blocks here that defines what segments a given process have access to. OK? Any other questions on that? Yes? So a segment register is uh, these things, which are defining the base and the limit of the segment. Yeah, so this would be actually hardware in the processor. Now, in something like the x86, the segment registers are actually not there aren't a power of two of them. There are like six. <laughs> okay, and they're defined as part of the state of the processor. Okay, good. So, and then the last sort of two level, this was my, uh, my favorite kind of arrangement because this is uh, a great uh, coincidence of numbers. This is the fact that at a 32 bit space and pages that are 4K, you can do something kind of cool which is, and this was a two-level page table, where what defines the process state is a page table pointer, which points at a page. And as long as our page table entries are four uh, bytes long, and I'll show you a four-byte page table entry in just a moment, then we can do the following trick. We divide our 32-bit virtual address space into a 12-bit offset, a 10-bit virtual index, and a 10-bit virtual index. 10 bits is 1,024 entries. Well. That's what you get when you take 2 to the 12th over 4 bytes an entry. You get 1,024 entries. So this 10 bits exactly selects one entry. You take that entry. That points to another page. That another 10 bits selects an entry. You take that out. And the last but not least, you point at the final page. OK, question. Yes? Yeah, so the reason this is advantageous is because just by marking things invalid at the first level, we can easily get rid of things at the second level. And so we can nicely deal with a very sparse address space where we have some stuff at the top and some stuff at the bottom and leave the rest of these null, and we don't have to have any data for the rest of this. You know, and we're, at worst, we're kind of losing a page. Ah, isn't that an interesting question? Do they exist or don't they exist? Depends. OK, if you're never going to use them, they don't have to exist. If you're going to use them, they do have to exist. Okay. I'll, uh, I'm being a little bit facetious. When I show you the page table uh, format, you can ask that question again if it still doesn't make sense. Question in the back? No. OK, so uh, Intel actually uses this scheme in the x86. They actually call this a directory rather than a page table but, or a page table entry. I like to think of this whole thing as the page table. It happens to be two levels. And each one of these entries on either side are called page table entries. I'll show you the format of that. The fact that 4K 
page size divided by four byte entries exactly fits for 32 bits is kind of a nice coincidence. And, and this is actually used uh, by lots of people. Yes? Yeah, you could think, yeah. Well, the offset, remember, uh, the way to think about a virtual address is we're never changing the offset. So the offset just gets copied. So in terms of all that we're really doing is we're deciding which of the physical pages in memory correspond to these virtual pages, which you could think of the red as defining virtual pages. The red over here is physical pages. and. All we're doing is matching page numbers here to page numbers over here. The offset just represents where we are in the page. And that doesn't get translated. In fact, uh, at the end of the lecture, I'm going to show you how we can use an interesting, we can use that in an interesting kind of hacky way to speed up translation, because there are some bits that basically never get translated, which are these lower 12 bits. And so we can start looking in the cache for those while we're translating the rest of the stuff. Good question. OK, any other questions? OK. Oh, one more. Yes. What I mean by sparse address space is really if you look at all the possible things from 0 to 2 to the 31, uh, you know, or 2 to the 32 minus 1, uh, not all of them are valid pages. So it's sparse rather than dense. Yeah, question. It's, uh, it actually, in this case, there's no limit because everything is pointing to a page away down. I'll show you a page table entry in just a sec. Hold on. Um, the other thing that I mentioned about this scheme is now we can page the page table. So what that means is I can actually mark entries here as invalid and have part of the page table out on disk so that a reference may go to this first level page table, page fault. Go into the kernel, load this part of the page table in, fix the page table, retry, go to the first to the second, then page fault here, pull the page in, go back, retry, one, two, got my page. Okay, So we could actually page out the page table and the pages. Okay, What about the first level page? Can we page this one out? Okay, Yeah, you got to pin that one. Otherwise, you got kind of chaos going on here. Okay. All right. Now, how do we uh, switch processes here? In the previous scheme, we had to swap out the segment register table. What do we do with this one? If we go from one process to another? Change the pointer to the page table. So this is just a single register. OK, good. I just wanted to make sure we were definitely clear. So if there are no more, yeah, one more question. Yes? In a real world implementation, people actually instead of swapping out page tables? Yes, they do. Because these are expensive. I mean, this is, you know, this gets big fast. Uh, you know, because we're really talking a million entries. Uh, so, you know, or, or we're talking 1,024, 1,025 pages are represent the page table. And then depending on how many processes you've got, if you've got hundreds of those, that's potentially a lot of page table space. And not everything's running all the time. So, yeah. OK. Yeah, question. Yes. OK. Yeah, you can't, uh, you can't compress and merge page tables like that. I mean, these are, so if you've got sparseness at some level, it really represents entries that are marked invalid, and there's pretty much. It seems like a waste, but if you compare it to the alternative of having you know, a complete page table that's just a single level, it's much worse in that case. No, I know. Well, you, uh, I'll be happy to chat with you afterwards about compression schemes. Maybe it's possible, but mostly they don't, because this is all done in hardware, so they want to keep it simple. Yes? There's no contiguousness involved here. I mean, this first 
well, every page is contiguous because you, you never break them up. So the only thing that needs to be contiguous is each of these pieces. No, nope, because all of memory is addressed by this two levels. It's, it's enough. So you, the only pointer you need is this one. I think I, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. OK. All right. So what do we want to do today? Let's finish this uh, address translation and protection, and then we're going to talk about caching and TLBs at the end of the lecture. Um, so what is a page table entry? I've been sort of implying these. Uh, it, well, it's basically one of these entries in a page table. <laughs> All right, end of story. But what's in it are things like a pointer to the next level page table, or maybe the actual page, things like permission bits, uh, valid, read only, read write, so on. Here is an actual Intel x86 page table entry. It's 32 bits. All right, so that's why it's four bytes in size. Notice that the top 20 bits is called a page frame number. And that's because we need 20 bits to uniquely specify all of the pages in a 32-bit physical page space. OK, because you need to specify 20 bits of address to say which of all the pages are there. Does that make sense to everybody? Because a page is uh, you know, 4K, so if we take the 32-bit address space, divide out the 4K, what we've got less, left is 20 bits worth of address as to which page it is. And so both at this level and at this level, we need those 20 bits. There they are. Okay. Now the question might be, what's the rest of the bits? Well, uh, there's a valid bit. OK, now Intel, I uh, have been making a little bit of fun of this term because they like to rename things other than everybody else. And so rather than a valid bit like everybody, they call it the present bit. But all right, same idea. Uh, there's the writable bit, which says you can write this page. There's the user accessible bit, which says the user's allowed to use this page. OK, there's a couple of things for caching, which we're not going to go into a lot of detail with. Uh, but they have to do with whether you can cache at all or, or whether you write through in the cache. And that's if you're using memory to do I.O. Uh, I'll, I'll mention this again when we get into real I.O. Um, this is an interesting bit. This bit gets set as any time the user accesses the page. Turns out when we start talking about page replacement algorithms and the clock algorithm, you'll see why accessed is useful. Dirty says whether the user's modified the page. That'll also be useful for the clock algorithm. And then the last thing, which is kind of uh, fun for the Intel case, is they have this L bit. And if L is 1, then there's only a single level page table. And uh, what that first level is pointing to is a 1 megabyte page. OK, go ahead. So this is just a few instructions to the memory management unit. Uh, well, I'm saying the processor algorithms running in the kernel reset it, and the hardware sets it. And you only reset it infrequently. So you, what you need, you really want the hardware to set it, because that's a, what you want to be a low overhead operation. But resetting it, you do in software. Okay. We'll talk about that when we get to the, uh, to the um, page replacement algorithms. OK, question. L is large. <laughs> Basically, when you have an L, what happens is this short circuits part of the page table so that rather than pointing to a second level page table, it means that this sucker points at a chunk of one megabyte in size. And you can use that for parts of the kernel and stuff that are basically uh, pinned and not going to get, uh, you don't need to swap a lot. OK. <laughs> All right. So how do we use the page table entry? So, what's it, so an invalid page table entry where the present bit is set 0 can do lots of things. So one is uh, it could mean that that part of address is actually invalid. 
Okay, and you should fault the process. It could mean that that part of the address space is out on disk somewhere. Okay, so just setting the hardware to be not present by putting a zero here, there needs to be some software interpretation of what that really means. All it means is the hardware can't translate automatically. Okay, and so um, basically the hardware checks the validity bit first, and if the validity bit is off, then the other 31 bits are available for the software to do something with. So for instance, they can say, where on disk is that page? Or they can say, this page is nowhere on disk. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do by putting them directly in the page table entry. Or you could put it somewhere else in the kernel. But the point here is that setting this to 0 uh, doesn't necessarily mean that something's out on disk. Um, so some examples, for instance, demand paging is the simple one, which we'll talk about next time after the exam, is, uh, well, you keep only the active pages in memory, so you swap everything else, or actually page everything else out. And if you go to use a page that's not in memory, you get a page fault, because it's marked invalid. The kernel pulls it in off the disk, restarts you. OK, so that's called demand paging, because you're paging things in on demand. And it basically lets us get the working set of the process into the DRAM and push, push everything else out to disk. And so unlike our previous segmentation scheme where we had to swap whole segments out, this now lets us swap out the parts we aren't using and keep the parts we are. Yeah? So um, uh, whether that top level thing's physical or virtual varies, but OK, let's call it physical. You can never page out the top level thing. It's always pinned if the process is running. So the top level part of the page table does, never goes out. Unless the process is totally paged out and not running, then you can get rid of the top level page. OK. Um, so here's another thing, copy on write. I, I think I mentioned the way Unix fork used to work uh, at the beginning of time. Uh, was that when you, you know, ran the fork system call, you ended up with a child process that had a complete copy of the parent's memory. Okay, now uh, we can debate and ask whether that's a good idea or not. Probably isn't. But the problem was in the original implementation, you actually, if it's supposed to have a gigabyte of memory, you actually copied a gigabyte and then you started the child process. OK? What you can do with pages is you can take the two page tables of the parent and the child. You can have the child's page table point at all of the parent's pages. OK? So first of all, now the child has the same memory as the parent, because they just point all the page table entries the same. But now we got a problem, because if either of them tries to write a page, it's going to screw things up. So what do we do? We, we mark all of the pages read only, and then point at the same set of physical pages. And what do I mean by that? Take a look down here, right? This is the da -dum. So both parent and child would have a similar page table that all pointed at the same ta uh, pages at the tail. We mark everything read only. And as soon as any of them write, either the parent or the child does a write, we page fault because it was marked read only. Now the kernel makes two copies of just the page that was modified. It's called copy on write. And it allows us to sort of on demand selectively make uh, only copies of those pages that are actually different. OK, does that make sense to everybody? Question? Sorry about the heat. Uh, another idea, and this is, is uh, quite useful as well, what you'd like is you'd like to make sure when you give new memory to a new process that it doesn't have things like old passwords in it and stuff, right, from the previous process. So typically, all pages are zero that are handled, handed to a, excuse me, a process. But rather than taking all the time up front to zero a bunch of pages that they may or may not use, uh, zero fill on demand is what you do when you allocate the pages, but you set them all invalid. The moment they try to either read or write them, they get a page fault. The kernel zeroes a page, hands it back to them. OK, so just by playing with these bits in the page table entry, we can do all sorts of stuff. OK? more than just demand paging, which is kind of the obvious thing that you might think of. OK, any questions on that? Are we good? 
now. So how is this translation accomplished? Typically, there's a piece of hardware called the memory management unit, MMU. Virtual addresses come out of the CPU. MMU translates them to physical. Uh, so what exactly happens inside the MMU? Well, presumably, kind of what we've been simulating in that first slide, right? So there's actual hardware in many cases that traverse the tree. So you, when you change processes, you change the pointer to the page table in this memory management unit. And every virtual address that comes out, the memory management unit translates it into a physical automatically for you. OK? So for every virtual address, takes page table base pointer, traverses page table in hardware. Uh, and of course, any time it actually finds a, an invalid page, it generates a page fault, and then the kernel has to deal. Okay, now, fortunately, you guys don't have to deal with page faults yet. That'll be project three. Okay. Um, so the pros of this is it's very fast. Okay. Cons are it's kind of inflexible. So if you have a memory management unit that knows about a tree of tables, then you can't do an inverted page table with it because the hardware doesn't know how to do that. Okay? So an alternative is actually to do all the translation in software. Okay? So every time you go to traverse the page table, you actually have software instructions that traverse it. Okay? The cool thing about this is it's very flexible. Okay? You could build a an offside tree of trees with an inverted page table in the middle of some part of your address space, if that was useful to you. Okay, the problem, of course, is what? Slow, right? I mean, if you imagine every load or store has to run through software to translate to find out where the physical address is, that sounds pretty bad, right? And how many people are getting a little nervous about this translation to start with, even in the hardware case? Because it seems like I'm doing a bunch of DRAM lookups just to do a single fast access, right? So even in the case of the hardware, this seems like adding virtual memory has slowed everything down, all right? And uh, the bottom line, of course, is you need a cache, OK? Now, this case could be a cache of translations, and we'll talk about this at the end of the lecture. OK. So. As I mentioned, now that we've got our MMU, I started to talk about this last time, who gets to modify the MMU? Who gets to change the base pointers? Well, only the kernel. Okay, and so that's where we have to have at least two modes, kernel and user. And this is basically how we, um, you know, we have some, some things are running in only kernel mode, and only those instructions actually get to modify. And this is how we protect. Okay. Um, I did mention that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so for instance, as I, I think I mentioned a couple of times, I wanted to say again, the Intel processor actually has four modes or rings of protection. And so in theory, uh, zero is the highest level and three is the lowest level. But you can actually arrange so that uh, those two intermediate levels represent intermediate protection between zero and three. Um, mostly those three modes were put in as a military spec on uh, minimum kind of levels of security that you need to have actually three, four levels. Most people uh, that do non-military kernels tend to use only two of the levels. They use zero and three. Okay. Um, if you're wondering who gets to set the page tables when you have four levels, you can actually, you can have a scenario where uh, you know, something at level two maybe can set page, uh, level three's page tables. That's not used very often, but um, in fact, it's probably not supported natively in, uh, in the normal x86. But you could imagine coming up with a scheme like that, but we're not, that's off, uh, more complicated than we need to go through. So we have at least two levels. And uh, what about going from kernel level to user? So one thing we could ask is, in a kernel's creating a new process, what's going to happen? Well, you've kind of gotten to see what creating a new process is about, right? You're doing that. Uh, clearly, you've got to allocate and initialize uh, some sort of control block, which is the page tables for the uh, address space. You've got to pull the program off the disk and store it in memory somewhere. Um, you have to allocate uh, all of the actual translation table entries. Point them at where your code is. Okay, possibly point at statically initialized data so your cough format can have 
instructions in it. It can have data. Okay, potentially it can have constants. Um, and then to actually run the program, you have to set up the machine registers to, to set the translation in, uh, and set the registers going, kind of like we talked about before. The only difference here from what we did you know, many weeks ago is we're starting to put the translation table initializing as part of this. Um, and then we switch to user mode and start running. Okay, now notice there really is nothing sophisticated there from a protection standpoint because we're already running at kernel mode, so the kernel could do anything it wants. It's going to set up some translations and then it's going to lower its privilege to user and run. Okay, and that's important that before we actually start executing the user's code, we, we lower to user mode. Okay, because otherwise we defeat all the purpose of our protection. Uh, you know, how does the kernel switch between processes? Well, we're running at user mode. How do we switch? If we're running at user mode and we want to switch between processes, we've got to somehow, well, OK, so maybe the user program executes a syscall to get us at kernel mode, all right? But unfortunately, that's kind of like executing yield. So what, el what else do we want to do maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Timer interrupt. What's the timer interrupt do? The first thing is it's got to go into kernel mode. OK? So interrupts clearly go into kernel mode. That's right. So uh, and once we're back in kernel mode, then it's a simple matter for the kernel to change all the translation state. OK? Good. Now, it's the other direction that's kind of interesting. We want the user to get into, system, into kernel mode. We mentioned interrupts a moment ago, and we'll talk, come back to those. But you know, this is using this asylum uh, analogy. We really can't let the, the inmate out of their padded cell except very uh, carefully. And so how does the user program get back into the kernel? And this is where we mentioned system calls. And um, it's kind of interesting. I have to discuss system calls several times throughout the term before people actually catch the significance. Um, you could think, on the one hand, a system call is a voluntary procedure call into the kernel. All right? That's not very uh, profound until you start thinking about the fact that the user is initiating something that's going to happen in kernel mode. And we've got to be very careful about that. And so it's not like we can let the user turn on the kernel mode bit and then start executing code. Why not? Because they could turn on the kernel mode bit and then screw the system up. So we need to have an atomic something that at the same time that it goes into kernel mode also goes to a very well-defined set of places in the kernel so that there is a call interface that's been previously set up by the kernel and that's only those particular interfaces that the user gets to use and those are called system calls. And what does that look like? It's actually a special software instruction typically called trap or syscall. And all it is is it's, uh, it's like a divide by zero instruction. It's a synchronous trap instruction that is like an error. So the user process is executing along, it hits trap, and poof, we're in the kernel at a well-defined place. And the user code stops running, and the kernel starts running exactly where you told it to out of a small set of things. And so we can't call any kernel routine, only the specific interfaces. And the way that usually happens is the trap instruction actually has an index as part of it that says, well, call system call 5. OK, and so you set up your registers and you execute trap and it'll start executing system call 5 at the beginning. That's the only thing the user's allowed to do and therefore we got our security. Because if we go in through the standard system call interfaces, then the kernel can check what the user gave it, make sure it's not handing them bad addresses, et cetera, et cetera, and just use the right interface. OK? Good to everybody? OK, so system calls are many things you're used to. Open, close, read, write, LSEQ, OK? Fork, exit, wait, those are all things uh, that are system calls. Are they all the same with different operating systems? No. They have the same arguments? No. Are they kind of mostly the same? Yes. All right, there's standards like POSIX, which try to standardize what the opens and reads and writes look like, but eh, uh, there are many differences, so you've got to watch carefully. Um, so at the beginning of the system call, we kind of uh, enter the kernel, set the system to kernel mode, go to a well-defined handler, 
and then uh, in registers uh, our arguments, and then it's up to the kernel to check them. And if the user gives data to the kernel for the system call, typically what happens is there's a copy from user space to kernel space, which you're all playing with now, right? Okay. Why do we want to copy data from user space to kernel space? Anybody? Yeah? Yeah, it's all about making sure the user can't mess things up. Another thing it may be about is whether the user's pages are pinned when you're in the kernel or not. So if the user sort of gives you some data and then the kernel starts executing, maybe that data will go away because it goes out to disk. And so you've got to make sure it's copied into the kernel so it won't go away. So there's a lot of good reasons for that. Most of them have to do with security. OK. Um, now, I want to just uh, move on to administrivia, and then we'll come back to traps. Huh? Yes. Yep. So uh, the question is kind of where are all these special tables? So in the case of page tables, the memory management unit has registers that the kernel sets. And so the current base pointer for the current page table is set by writing these registers. Uh, in terms of where are the uh, kernel trap routines, oftentimes uh, they're fixed. They're like, uh, you know, trap zero is at a well-defined part of, of, phys or of uh, virtual kernel space. So you can't even move it. It's like the bottom of the space. And that's fixed by the hardware. Yeah, it's fixed by the hardware architecture. Now, there are a few, uh, let me think. I don't know. If, I'm not thinking right offhand. There may be an architecture or two where there's a register where you could set that, but they're usually often fixed. So this depends a lot on the hardware architecture. This is something you'd have to take up with the user manual for the particular architecture you're interested in. So as you know, midterm is, oh, question? Yes. Yes. Right. Well, but if you have multiple threads, then it's possible that if you have some arguments in user space that you're passing to the kernel, and the kernel validates them and then starts using them, and then another thread that's still running starts messing with them, then you could have a problem because you're, you know, you've defeated all attempts to validate them. Whereas if you, you know, copy them, validate them, now you know nobody can touch them because they're in kernel space. Uh, well, syscalls, some syscalls try to run atomically without interrupts happening, but mostly you're, unless they're running at very high priority, they have interrupts on. Yeah. Yes. Yes. In modern kernels. Didn't used to be. Used to be that only one thing could be running in the kernel at a time. But uh, certainly today, things, multiple things can run in the kernel. OK, so midterm Monday. Hopefully, it's not a big surprise to everybody. Yes? Uh, yes? Yeah, you know, 18, 19. What's kind of funny is these only vary plus or minus a day from year to year sometimes. But anyway, uh, yeah, it's, on the, it's, it's this Monday. <laughs> rather than uh, a Monday a year ago on the 19th. Uh, it's from 6 to 9 p.m. at 155 Dwinnell. Um, you're welcome to bring a single page of notes. Do not bring your computer. Uh, if we see a cell phone, uh, we're probably going to confiscate it. So maybe don't even bring your cell phone or make sure it's put away. Um, and uh, this handwritten, they're handwritten notes both sides. You can use up your 8.5 by 11 any way you want. Uh, this is not, you know, huge paper. This is regular eight and a half by eleven. Uh, no books. Uh, I think that's basically it. Um, no class in the day of midterm. I'm actually going to have office hours from two to five, and I may actually go to five thirty depending on circumstances and if there's clamoring people there. 
Um, I don't know whether the TAs will tell you on Friday whether they're going to have extra office hours or whatever. I know that we certainly have design reviews that are kind of going for your 20 minutes on Monday, so the TAs are probably pretty busy. Um, but they might have some extra time Thursday or Friday. Um, topics are everything up to today. Okay. Uh, I don't know if any of you have not filled out group evaluations. I haven't checked the totals yet, but if you haven't, you should do that. Make sure you do it. Uh, Project 2 is due Friday. No, the uh, design document's due Friday. <laughs> and uh, always look at the lecture page for uh, dates. I don't think we've had any problems this term yet, but uh, occasionally people think something's due at a time when it's not uh, because of somewhere else on the website. Always look at the lecture page. OK. Oh, and also, um, we are having a uh, midterm review, uh, 306, I think. Where's Hilfie? Did we verify 306? Uh, we're doing it on 306. They'll, all three TAs will be there from 7 to 9 on Sunday. OK? So this is uh, midterm review Sunday, 7 to 9, 306 soda. Yeah, this is PM. Yeah, not, I don't think 7 exists, actually. I think there's a singularity before 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, OK, good. And if you haven't told me that you can't take the exam on Monday yet for some reason, make sure you, uh, it may be too late. But if you can't, you should make sure to justify it somehow. Let me know why. Um, OK. Any questions about midterms or administrivia? OK, so what I want to do is I want to finish up uh, one last little thing here. And then we'll take a break. So uh, one other way to get user to kernel, which I mentioned, was exceptions, both interrupts and traps. And uh, so a system call is actually a special type of exception. It's a trap instruction. It's often called a software trap, syscall instruction, whatever. But it's actually an exception. It's basically something that can't execute. And so it traps into the kernel to a special handler. It's just like divide by 0 or something else. Okay? It's basically as bad as that. Uh, other types of synchronous exceptions, you know, divide by 0, illegal instruction, bus error, bad memory, uh, Page fault is a good synchronous exception, right? There's an example where you try to do a load or store at page faults. You got to stop, right? The user code can't run. The kernel's got to run, OK? Uh, interrupts are an example of asynchronous exceptions. Notice synchronous exceptions kind of happen in line in the address uh, or in the instruction stream. These are things that basically the instruction stops because you can't go any further. Asynchronous exceptions basically aren't tied to particular instructions. You know, the instructions are executing, and at some point an interrupt comes in, and you know, you stop running and go do the interrupt. Okay, so timer, disk, network, these are all uh, examples of asynchronous exceptions. You can disable interrupts, but you can't disable traps. Why? Well, because when you hit a bad point in the instruction stream, you gotta stop. Does everybody see that difference between synchronous and asynchronous? So uh, on any of these types of exceptions, you know, uh, system call, interrupt, et cetera, hardware enters kernel mode with interrupts disabled, saves a PC, jumps to appropriate handler. Um, some processors save all the registers for you, but you may need to save them if you've got a processor that doesn't. And uh, then you're in kernel mode, OK? And, uh, are there any questions on that? Yeah. Where does the processor save the registers? Uh, that depends on the processor. <laughs> Presumably, it's saving them to your stack or something like that. Um, but uh, oftentimes, what happens here is uh, the hardware saves a couple instructions or a couple of pieces of state, like the PC and stuff that you couldn't do in software anyway in a well-defined place, and then the interrupt handler gets a kernel stack and then saves the rest of the stuff on the kernel stack. So that's a more detailed what actually happens. Yeah. 
Well, uh, I mean, the simplest thing is you just sort of stop fetching instructions and just wait till it's drained. Um, you know, in principle, although most people don't implement this, with hyperthreading, you could actually have the interrupt start as a thread kind of on top of the rest of them and just kind of merge its instructions in. Um, there aren't too many processors that do that, unfortunately. But, so usually what happens is you just stop fetching, what's in the pipeline drains out, and then you start with the interrupt handler. Okay. Uh, so if you actually look at the MIPS ISA, um, which you may deal with, it's kind of interesting. There's actually this interface called coprocessor zero, which is used by the kernel code to, to actually measure or to read things like what was the cause of the exception. So there's a special register 13 in coprocessor zero that says you, tells you what caused the exception. And what was the PC where the exception happened? And what was the bad virtual address? So these are all things that you get by accessing coprocessor zero in the kernel after the exception handler has started executing. Okay. Now there's also typically some sort of stack of, uh, uh, for instance, in MIPS, there's this stack of whether you're in kernel mode or user mode and whether interrupts are enabled. And what typically happens is you interrupt into the kernel, the stack gets pushed, so whatever the state of K and E were, you get a new K and E, which is you're in kernel mode and interrupts are disabled. And then if you pop and you return from interrupt, you're back to where you started. So anyway, these are all details you can get uh, by looking at a user manual. Okay, so as a closing thought on all of this, do you really need hardware support for translation and dual mode behavior in order to get protection? So I've been kind of pushing it that, you know, oh yeah, you do. Technically you don't, okay? Think about Java, okay? The idea of the Java virtual machine was that uh, you take the program you're running and you put a sandbox around it in a way that it's not allowed to do anything it's not allowed to do. And it's done entirely in software, okay? The problem is that sometimes this, so, so basically you can emulate any processor you want entirely in software and then run code on top of the thing that you're emulating. Like for instance, nachos, <laughs> okay? That's exactly what you're doing for project two. You're emulating a MIPS processor running, you know, in, you know, the emulator is running in Java and you're emulating a MIPS processor and you're running C code in your emulated processor running in the Java virtual machine. Okay, so if that uh, hasn't confused your brain uh, enough, think about it a little more. So protection uh, can also be gotten by putting a strong language and typing around things. So you basically make a language where you can never do anything you're not supposed to do. Okay, um, there's lots of examples of language that are strongly typed in that way. C is a great example of a language that's not strongly typed. You can do all sorts of bad things in C. Okay, the only problem with relying on your language is that then if you get binaries that are compiled by somebody's evil compiler, you don't have any protection against it. Okay. Um, and so basically, uh, you know, the fact that people build virtual machines entirely in software should be kind of interesting to you guys. And VMware is certainly the one that was best known for this. And the idea is they take the code that you're protecting against and they dynamically compile it into code that doesn't do bad things. Okay, and, and you can run it safely. Okay, so you may ask why do we go to all this trouble of telling you about hardware? Well, hardware is faster, more ubiquitous, and it's uh, less prone to being uh, beat by software bugs like in the compiler and in the virtual machine. Okay, good. I think I'm done with that. Any questions? Okay, so let's take about a three minute break. Hopefully uh, people will stop breathing long enough for it to get cool in here, and then we'll come back and talk about caching.
right. Now that we're revitalized and somewhat cooled down, you guys must have stopped breathing or something, which is good. No, I'm just kidding. That's not good. Actually, maybe what really happened is the faculty member who's full of hot air stopped talking long enough for it to. Oh, okay. So, moving. Yeah, I said it. So, moving on to caching here. So, the idea behind a cache, which you got from the first day you were students in this department, probably, at least in 61C, probably A as well. Uh, is something that, it's funny, we find that even seniors don't always get it, so we got to mention it many times. But a cache, that's not, by the way, I didn't get it either when I was an undergraduate. Um, a cache is a repository for copies that can somehow be accessed more quickly than the original. That's the simple idea of a cache. And I, I like this image of a desk. It's sort of, you put all the things you need quick access to on your desk, and then when you're done with them, and theory, you file them so that you have space for other things. Uh, some of us tend to just get piles. But anyway, the key thing about a cache is to make the frequent case fast and the infrequent case less dominant. So the frequent case, hopefully, is that it's on your desk. Okay, the infrequent case is you've got to go to the file cabinet and get something to put it on your desk. Okay, so that's about the cache. If it turns out that most of the time you're getting up to go to the file cabinet, what's the point of having the desk in the first place? Okay? Now, it, it's, uh, when I teach 152, I like to joke that everything in computer architecture is a cache, okay? which is kind of true, because you can cache pretty much everything. Memory locations, address translations, pages, file blocks, file names, network routes. I'm uh, focusing this on OSs, of course. But pretty much, uh, if it takes any time to compute something, there's a cache involved somewhere to try to speed that up. And it's only good if the frequent case is frequent and the infrequent case is not too expensive. Okay, and if either of these two are violated, the cache doesn't help you. Okay, and you can say that an important measure is the average access time is kind of the hit rate times the, times the hit time plus the missed rate times the missed time. Okay, Not, and uh, what do we know about hit rate plus missed rate? Hopefully equal to one, right? Okay, so assuming that our hit rate is high enough and that the miss rate is low and the miss time is not too big, then this number is low. And it's much lower than it would be if we always had to go off and do the miss time. Okay, that's the simple idea here. Now, why bother with caching? Well, as you may uh, have seen multiple times in this class, we have Joy's Law, which is this growth. Uh, yes, go ahead. So I have a question on that equation. So don't you always pay the cost of hit time? Or are you including the cost of Well, it depends on whether miss time includes hit time or not. Usually there is. Uh, you always pay the cost of the hit time. You always pay the cost of the hit time, but this is whether this is miss time or miss penalty. So miss penalty is usually uh, what you get when you do, don't include the hit. So uh, that's a good question. So this, this miss time is hit time plus miss penalty in this case. Good. Uh, we'll show you that later for those of you that want to ignore that comment. So, uh, so we talked about Joy's Law, and you know it all tails off here in 2002 for lots of reasons. But if you actually look at DRAM speed in that time, uh, I like to joke that this is called Less's Law because it's still exponential, but it's a lot less than Moore's Law, which is really Joy's Law. Okay, and as a result, this gap was growing exponentially for decades, and so without caching, computer architecture would be dead. All right. Now, uh, this gap was growing at 50% a year, which is just drastic. Okay, so. Uh, another reason to deal with caching for this class is look at all this technology or this complication we added for translation, right? You start with a virtual segment ID, you look that up, then you take the base here and you take the virtual page number and then you go off and you find that in the page table and then you, you, know, you take this page number and you put it into your address and then you take that address and then you go probably to the cache and then you go from the cache and maybe you miss and you go to DRAM and oh my gosh, we have made something as simple as a loader store have a whole bunch of, of accesses involved. So we, it sounds like we've just made things really slow. Okay? And you, know, you clearly can't afford to translate on every access because this, a lot of those multi-level page tables look like about three DRAM accesses to do one access. <laughs> right? And 
when DRAM is doing this, it makes no sense to go off and go through your multi-level page table in DRAM just to do a single access. Okay, it's awful. So what do we do is we cache translations. Okay, now when you're the first person to come up with an idea, you get to name it. Okay, translation look aside buffer. Does anybody know who named that? Huh? Anybody have any idea? Three letter agency? IBM, IBM yes. Okay, not CIA. So, I, <laughs> so IBM named this and uh, we've got it from now, uh, from that point on. Whether or not you, uh, it should have been called the translation cache or not, it's, uh, it's the translation look aside buffer. And it basically says, this page table isn't changing much, therefore if we cache the values, we're pretty good. Okay, it's unlikely to change. And so why does caching help in general? And the notion there is locality. And of course, there's two types of locality, spatial and uh, temporal. Temporal locality says that if you access something, you're likely to access it again soon. Okay? That would be if I put something on my desk and I put it close to me because I just looked at it, I'm likely to look at it soon. Right? That's pretty clear. Spatial locality says that if I look at something, I'm likely to look at something close to it soon. That's like going to your file cabinet, grabbing a whole file folder full of stuff. I may look at the first page, put it down, but then I'm likely to look at another page in the same folder. Okay? Um, and of course, uh, we can put multiple levels of cache. So um, the processor may have a request in the first level cache that may get uh, satisfied. And if that misses, it may go to lower level memory, which could be a second level, third level, fourth level cache before it actually gets to DRAM. Okay? In the case of TLBs, oftentimes there's only one level there, but you can actually have multiple levels of TLBs as well. Um, so the modern memory hierarchy in CPUs today are basically trying to take advantage of, of locality to make it look like you have as much memory as you could put in the cheapest and slowest technology with the speed of the fast, small technology. Okay, so for instance, registers are small and fast. Tape. Big and slow. Okay, so the idea here is if you're really caching across all these levels, you want to make things look as fast as registers with the speed of tape. Okay, now the only way that could possibly work is if as you use things, you migrate them up in the hierarchy so that it's faster and faster to get at them, point A. And point B, there better be enough locality to make that worthwhile. If you spend a bunch of time fetching something, up in the first level to only use it once, then you've just wasted time putting stuff in a cache and you probably kick something else out that was useful. Okay? All right, so this is all 61C for everybody, right? Does this sound familiar? Good. Now, uh, there are actually, Berkeley is kind of famous for the three C's, because Mark Hill, when he was a PhD student, yeah, yeah, hold on a sec. When Mark Hill was a PhD student here, uh, he said, gee, there's three sources of, of, uh, of uh, misses. There's compulsory capacity and conflict, and this caught on. Uh, the compulsory misses are the fact that it's not in your cache because it's, you've never seen it before. You've never gone to even bring it in. That's a compulsory miss. A capacity miss is I go to look on my desk, it's missing, but I had it there before. Why is it not there now? Well, I, you know, my desk isn't big enough, so I pushed it off the desk. Okay, the capacity of my desk wasn't big enough to hold it, but I, so I missed the second time around. And then finally, a conflict miss basically has to do with the fact that uh, only certain values can go in certain places in my cache. Okay, if the associativity is direct mapped or two-way set associative, a conflict miss could be that it's not there anymore after I look at it because the associativity is too low. And I'll show you what that means in a second. Finally, there is a fourth one. Uh, I often call this the three C's plus one, which is coherence misses. And coherence misses are very easy to understand. You got two processors in the system. The first one reads a value, and it's in its cache, and it's happily using it. The second one writes it. Okay, what better happen is after that write happens, it better kick it out of the first person's cache, otherwise they're seeing an old value. Okay, so that's actually a coherence miss. Because the next time I go to look, it's missing, and it's not there because cache coherence forced it out. 
Okay, so these are, this is a model of where misses come from in caches. And it turns out that while it's not perfect, it's usually a very good way to analyze any caching situation. When you're starting to miss in the cache a lot, you can say, well, which type of miss is causing this? And, um, and what can we do about it? There's another type of caching, which we'll get to after the exam next Wednesday, which is paging. Okay, and that's basically this level here where we treat the disk as a cache on, or excuse me, treat DRAM as a cache on the disk. And when we're paging there, we'll have a lot of questions about why do we miss? Why is something not in memory when, it's, uh, when it should be? And that'll be a different, you know, we'll have to analyze the so sources of those cache misses. And that will uh, lead us to the clock algorithm and so on. Okay, any questions on these? So how do you find a block in a cache? Well, this is going to look familiar to what was in the earlier part of the lecture. Once again, you lay the address out and you start dividing bits up. Okay, you guys are going to get good at this by the end of the, of the uh, course. But in this case, we typically have the full address is divided into a block offset, which looks an awful lot like a page offset, but is typically only a few bits, like five uh, to seven. There's an index which selects the set and a tag which is uh, used to decide whether you're in the cache or not. So the index is used to look up things in the cache. The tag is used to actually see whether it's there or not. And a block uh, is sort of the minimum quanta of caching, just like a page was the minimum quanta of paging. Okay, now uh, the easiest way to see this is what's a direct map cache? Okay, so here we go. Uppermost 32 minus n bits are the tag, and the lower bits are the byte select. So if you take a look here, here is our um, address. We've got a, a, a cache sizes. The uh, cache lines are all uh, 32 bytes. Why do I know that? Because there's five bits down here. The index, OK, this is uh, bits 5 to 9, basically tells me that there's actually how many entries there? 32. OK, that's another five bits. And then the top remaining bits, OK, so we got 10 bits down here. How many are up here? 22. The remaining bits are used as the tag. And so let's take a look at what happens. We take the index. That selects where we are in the cache. So now notice, by the way, this is the cache. And every cache line has 32 bytes in it, because we have a 32-byte cache line. And it's got a tag and a valid bit. So the index says which one to look up. Uh, we ch check the tag. If what's here matches the bits that are in the tag, then we know we have a cache miss, I mean a cache hit. If they don't match, we have a miss. OK? So we look up the index. We check the tag. If it matches, then we've got 32 bytes, which we can select based on our byte select, period. OK? If it, if it misses, then we've got to go to the next level of the cache. Okay, now, why is this called a direct map cache? Well, because the index picks out exactly one cache line as a candidate, and either it matches or it doesn't. So it's directly indexed cache. Now, this valid bit, by the way, uh, is a way to you know, initialize the cache to be all invalid, for instance, when you boot the system up. OK, questions? All right, uh, the uh, set associative cache. OK, so let's show you a two-way set associative. Here's a case where we now have two cache uh, banks. The index selects two possible candidate tags, A and B. We take the tag, uh, part of the address. We check against the tag on bank one and bank two. One of them might match. The one that matches, we select with the MUX, and we get our data out. OK, so this is a two-way set associative cache because there's two possible ways, two places where the data can be. So every data item can be in one of two sides of the cache. Question, yes? Is that part of the problem? The virtual address, what is that? Right? It looks like it has a cache tag. Like, this has a tag, but now what's the original address of the virtual address? OK, so is this set of 32 bits here a virtual or physical address? Depends. Great answer. It depends on whether we go to the cache before or after we translate. If we go to the cache before we translate, that's a virtual address. If we go to it after we translate, that's a physical address. 
So the point is that this level of caching here is independent of the virtual memory lookup. Okay. They were divided up differently, and these are com two completely different divisions on the same bits or different bits, depending on whether it's virtual or physical address. Yes, question. So the reason to cache virtual addresses is for speed reasons. Since the processor deals only with virtual addresses, you just go directly to the cache and look it up and you're good to go. And the only time you have to go to the page table is when you cache miss. Now, the reason to do physical addresses, which is what most people do, is because virtual addresses have some weird alias problems. Like if you have two processes that are running and they both think they have zero, in a virtual uh, cache, You'll get confused as to which process it is. Okay, question. Can you yes. Just, like, invalidate all the entries and yep, you'd have to invalidate. We'll talk about that next time. Good. So let's just finally look at a fully associative cache. So here's a case where notice there's no longer an index at all in a fully associative cache. Why is that? Because every cache line is compared in parallel. I take the tag, I check it against every cache line. The one that happens to match is the one that I uh, use. Okay. Now, notice the direct map has limited place where an item could go. So every address can go in exactly one place in the cache. That is fast. But we get more conflicts because if two things happen to map in the same place in the cache, they'll kick each other out. And that's where we get conflict misses from. Uh, if we have a fully mapped cache, we will never have conflicts. Because uh, the only time we ever kick something out of the cache is if we don't have enough space, not because of a conflict. Now, why is, why is it that we don't have fully mapped caches uh, everywhere in the system? Yes? Yeah, this is, this is expensive from a space standpoint, because there's comparators everywhere. OK. All right, so just to, to wrap this idea up here, here is a simple address space. We're interested in block number 12. We have a very simple 8-byte cache. <laughs> okay? If it's direct mapped, what we do is we take 12 mod 8, and that tells us which cache line it can go to. Why do I say mod 8? Well, that means I, I got rid of the low three bits. right? The low three bits are uh, basically doing this, uh, helping me with my mod. right? Now, if it's set associative, typically there are two places I can go. And if it's fully associative, it can go anywhere. OK? All right. Good. I think we're done for now. Uh, so uh, we talked about locality a bit today. Um, and uh, temporal spatial locality are uh, the two reasons why we can use caching. We talked about the 3 plus 1 types of cache misses, compulsory conflict, capacity, and coherence. Uh, we talked about organizations for the cache, direct map, set associative, fully associative. We started, we talked about what page table entries look like, okay? Uh, we talked about TLBs for caching. By the way, TLBs are typically fully associative. And the reason for that is the cost of walking the page table is so high that we can't afford the conflicts. Okay, so TLBs basically are fully associative. On the TLB miss, we have to walk the page table. And uh, on the context switch, we're going to have to uh, possibly invalidate the page table somehow, or the TLB somehow. We'll talk about that when you get back for the exam. Good luck, everybody. Go to section on Friday. There'll be a review session on Sunday.